Hello, hello, and welcome, welcome to yet another uh, conversation with series here at Agora Community. We have uh, quite the guest here today. Um, I'll let him introduce himself because I'm sure he's better at it than I am. But uh, we have Ted T with us today, who has uh, a very, very long, long, rich history in the animation industry, starting back in the golden era of classical animation. If you can believe it, uh, it's a, it's a, I, so it's something that I've done myself in, in, in the past, and it seems like we're quite the dying breed. So starting there and having many, many, many years of you know supervising, supervising and direction experience um, after that, I've had the pleasure myself of listening to this fine man speak many times at conferences it's uh, if you ever get a chance to see ted talk you definitely should make it out to a conference that uh, <laughs> that's assuming we have conferences one day again uh but uh, try to get try to see one of his, his talks because they're very inspiring usually deep uh, digs digs in deep on the subjects of like character motivations and i always find them ex extremely interesting and inspiring no matter uh how many times i uh, I, I see them so uh, i'm gonna bring in uh david hubert who's my partner in crime as usual and then we'll bring in Ted, and we're going to have a fun time like we usually do in here. Hello, David. Oh, hey, Brent. How are you? Yet again. I'm good. Neat. Online. Yet again. Excited. Pretty I'm excited. excited. Yes. Yeah, uh, this discussion with Ted. Absolutely. It's, uh, it's, uh, the only, the only tricky thing today is going to be making sure you both don't speak about hockey the entire time. That's the only <laughs> thing I'm, I'm going to be the referee of this conversation. I have my whistle. If it gets out of hand, I'm blowing it. All right, let's bring in Ted. <laughs> good. Head, my friend. Hello, how are you? <laughs> Hello, thanks how for I, the intro. Yeah, well, I mean, I, uh, I, I'm sure that you can do a better job than me, but uh, you know, um, mm -hmm. um, I think this is, I guess, this is probably your chance. I don't know. How do you want to start this? Um, I don't know. Thank you first for the forewarning of uh, not talking about hockey. <laughs> <laughs> I would have forgotten that this it's, is live stream, and you know, I think it, yeah. it's going to happen, and it's it's fine. I'm just going to make sure it doesn't like you know. There's no no offside, yeah. all right. I'm just I'll be watching the blue line. This is yeah. me trying to pretend. I'm trying to talk lingo. I'm not as nearly as big of a hockey fan as both Ted and David. This is me trying to pretend that I am. I'm I'm, I'm a chameleon. I'm a hockey fan chameleon. I can probably start with how I actually met Ted. In That's the, a good idea. Uh, a, yeah. a, in the first place, let, the let, let, let's start there. Um, as far as I remember, it was I think it was my first day at uh, at DreamWorks, and I was you know your first day at, at, at work. What is my login? Oh, a computer! Wow, I have an office. I never had an office as an animator before, and I, and I have this super energetic guy that enters the room and <laughs> said something along the lines of, "Hey, I heard that there's another guy from Montreal over here. Where, where is he?" Or something <laughs> amazing. Like that. Just Strength super excited. Numbers. Uh, you know, probably within 30 seconds, start to talk about the abs and Aki and, you know, animation and, and all that. So uh, I would say like within, we're probably friends within 30 seconds. So, oh, yeah. so that was, that's a, that's pretty, that was a pretty high estimate. 
Yeah, I know. It's that. probably a little le less de yeah. de than that. But I remember, and you know, I was not even 30 years old at, at, at this at this point. And I was fairly sure that Ted was younger than than, than I was <laughs> at, at, at that point. And then we started to talk a little bit about our career, what we did before. And, you know, he's been there mm. for a, a couple of years. He was in Kung Fu Panda. Before that, he was at Disney. And, you know, work on Lilo and Stitch and Mulan. <laughs> Lion King and like, Aladdin, minute, and then I was like, "Wait a minute, <laughs> what actually is going Dracula. on? Because He's immortal. He's right been around now, forever." You, yeah, you were this. <laughs> you worked on movies that I've seen when I was like, a, <laughs> like a child. What what, what the hell amazing. is going on? And that's uh, when you know he, he gave me his his secret for eternal uh, youth, yeah, which it. was a, a rice and tea that I'm still <laughs> remembering today. That's it. Yep. He told his super serious rice and tea. That's yeah. it. <laughs> That's the yeah. And now that I have moved back to Montreal, the secret is pogos and and orange julep. You know, uh, oh, orange julep exactly off of the well, carry. Yeah, oh, yeah. As That's you're tough. aging, you have to adapt your your diet. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's it. It's yeah, also but, it's a climate thing, I think too. I think you need to have those things just to survive the winters here. Maybe. Yeah, you need a little a little bit more meat around the bone to, exactly to survive the, the 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 winter but maybe that's a good place to uh, uh uh to start so your experience uh, at disney how did you uh, again how did you get there uh in the first place and how for the few years that you were there yeah i think um i guess if we back up a little like i went to concordia i studied uh, communication studies here in montreal you know and Near the end of comm studies, I took a class with a friend of mine, uh, Jean-Pierre Bois, who's also in the community here in Montreal, in the animation community. And um, we're the only two people I knew that were doing animation. And we took a class and um, it was really fun. It was it was like my stuff was terrible. I did a golf swing and <laughs> it's like uh, if, if anyone ever got hold of it, it'd be good blackmail material. Um, <laughs> But I remember at the end of the class, you know, my, my teacher said, you know, uh, there's a place in California if you're serious about it, but, you know, you could also try out Sheridan, um, but there's a place in, in L.A. and you can try and apply there. I applied and I got lucky, mostly because the application form was really small. Uh, so I applied because at that point I was applying to law school. And uh, it was like eight million pages of application stuff. So I was like, I had no idea what uh, a portfolio was, whatever. So my friend came over and he shot some video of my drawings and uh, we sent it in. I got in. And then after a couple of years uh, at, uh, at CalArts, I um, went to the Disney feature animation internship, which was the second version of how they recruited people. There was actually a program prior to mine called the um, uh, Disney Animation Training Program that was in Burbank, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, like Press Romanios and and, and um, that whole crew, you know, uh, learned from that program. And then, oh, well, actually, Press tried to get into that program and didn't, and went the other way around, and ended up becoming one of Glenn's disciples, you know, mm -hmm. um, but. Uh, the other one was in Florida, and uh, I applied and, again, got super lucky. And, um, yeah, that's where I started. I started <laughs> I started uh, on Valentine's Day and found out that the directors had been fired or, or they left. Oh, and I started in downtime, <laughs> and I was getting paid, like, 400 bucks a week or whatever. I'm like, yes, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> – I'm getting paid to do something and like, what do I do? And they're yeah. like, chill and just do whatever for now. So I just, I was my chance and I just, I had the desk and I couldn't believe it. And there's like free paper. And uh, so, free paper. Yeah, free paper. Like, free punch you know, paper. Free punch yeah, probably. It's all ready for us, you know? And uh, so a, a working pencil sharpener. So yeah, I just started there. That's cool. As an in between, hmm. in betweener and cleanup. So what was the, uh, the the first feature you worked on? <laughs> Lion King. <laughs> you want to bring it was that Lion up King. <laughs> yeah, that was, the, <laughs> that was the very first one. Um, actually, when I left school, it was still called <clears throat> King of the Jungle. Oh, wow. And, Before they yeah. changed it. And I remember it was like Mermaid, uh, Beauty, 
And then Aladdin um, was just finishing when I arrived in the internship. And then uh, the, the, um, then the film was uh, still called King of the Jungle. And everyone was, as, was saying, oh, you missed the big movies. You have to go work on that King of the Jungle movie. And everyone was hearing it wasn't going well. I'm like, I don't care. You know, this is amazing. And uh, it ended up, you know, being the first movie to break a billion dollars yeah. worldwide. It was a milestone for sure. Yeah. 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 And it changed everything, though. It Prior to that film making that much money, really, Disney felt like an artistic entity entirely. And after that, it became a financial entity. And you could feel it. You could actually feel it. You know, things changed. I mean, it was a great boon for animators who'd been there forever. You know, like my heroes that were there, um, you know, Mark Ken and Ruben and Ruben Aquino and those kinds of people, you know, um, Glenn, obviously, and Andreas. But it was an opportunity for them to finally kind of uh, be compensated for all of their years of hard work during, you know, the Black Cauldron and... <laughs> And, and things like that. So uh, that was really huh. fantastic. But I'd never, just to be a part of a, a film like that was was uh, really cool. Something that we 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 talked about a few uh, a few weeks ago was this uh, uh, imposter syndrome. When you you know get fresh out of school, get to Disney, you're on those feature, you have those legends around you, and you're like. What the hell am I going here? Who, who, and when is going to find out <laughs> that, that yeah. I'm here? Is, is that something that you that you experience and you uh, you you had to deal with? Yeah, you know what? Like, I think maybe I was even too naive to feel that. <laughs> like, I just felt like I was in my next place. You know, like you go to school, that's your next place, and then you move on to your job, that's your next place. And I really felt like, okay, I didn't. Feel like I belong there, but I but I was there, and <laughs> and I was like, okay, well, I'm just gonna try my best and um, you know, kind of live up to the name. Like I felt a lot of pressure to live up to the name. I think I felt that more than anything. Mm. Like, mm. you know, studying the illusion of life every day, and you know, uh, also when I got in there, someone who'd gotten the internship before me, who was a former CalArts student really set a bad precedent and i think the tone for people from my school was put in a really bad light and so i didn't know why i was kind of taking some like unspoken heat and i thought i'd said or done something wrong and uh, come to find out that guy had kind of uh, uh given us a bit of a bad name unfortunately but you know everyone was so kind there and everyone was so young Uh, but yeah. I just tried to absorb as much as I could so I didn't look stupid. <laughs> yeah. You know? And um, it, yeah, that was it. it. It feels a lot when you get out of school that, you know, you you kind of learn the fundamentals at school, but it's really when you have your first job that you really uh, start to to learn for a year, that you're properly, uh, you know, mentored by other professionals and, and that. Uh, what would you say were you, your first main lesson that you learned when you start working at, at Disney from either, you know, the uh, leadership team or your peers or, you know, about production or what would be the, the main thing that uh, you have on, on top of your head? Uh, I think the main thing was things aren't always fair. Like hmm. it, was a, it was a tough thing because I remember I had done in the span of like a year, like 30, almost 13, uh, 10 animation tests. And I was working really hard, like around the clock. And at that time, I didn't know that in Florida, there was like promotional times where you started to do tests. And um, there was one promotional period where, you know, very few, there was actually quite a few slots and few people applying. So I was hoping with all the work I'd put in that it would work out. But, you know, at the time you think you're really ready And uh, when it doesn't happen, it really threw me for a loop. And um, I remember that I was kind of like, wow, that didn't play out like I thought. And I remember Glenn came down uh, from, well, came over from California and we talked about it. And he said, you know, the direct path that seemingly is the way that you 
you think you ought to go is not generally the way it happens, <laughs> you know? And he goes, like, there's a lot of people um, that I know that didn't go the path that they expected to go, and they were disappointed, but things work will work out. And it's kind of, you know, a hard pill to swallow, even when your hero is telling you about it. But then I, I just kept working, and it ended up working out in the most, like, kind of miraculous of ways. So you never know. I, I think you just – it tests your ability to be resilient – I think a lot of people think that it's just like rainbows and sunshine, but anyone who's been an animator in any medium, in any studio at any time, whether it's a big studio or a small one, don't get it wrong. The people at the small studio, people at Disney go through it too. You, you're going to struggle and you're going to be really tested and your resilience and your, mm -hmm. your uh, desire is going to be tested all the time. It's, it's something that you have to put your back into to really earn, you know, like there's no handouts that I've ever seen, but it's good because if you end up, you know, moving forward and growing, you know that you had a, a large part in and doing it for yourself along, of course, with like the helping hand of, of someone who's always shepherding you along. I think that was a primary other thing I learned from Disney is that you can never underestimate the power of mentorship, uh, mm -hmm. whether it's direct or it's subtle. You know, like I, the timing of how I was mentored in kind of like three different styles or four different styles from different people um, in, in indelibly affected how I see um, being an animation director or, um, or how I treat people or how I teach. Mm -hmm. I have a quick question though regarding that specific topic because i haven't talked about this in quite a while but because i did experience 2d uh back in the day i i too have a sort of a different perspective on how animation can be done um and it's it's in it's there's an interesting gap on this very specific intersection of, of mentorship with regards to 3ds one of the things i noticed the, it, the first things i noticed when i started supervising in 3d was that it's interesting that 2D has a built-in mechanism for this that's very hands-on because you usually start as an in-betweener and or an assistant. You, you are working literally, quite literally, with the drawings of your supervisor. Like you are right. involved and you're learning through osmosis almost just by being inside there. And then suddenly... You like that's that was that's the that was the typical path of, of a 2D animator, right? You yeah. you work through the, the ranks and eventually you'll be an animator one day when then you you have a, an assistant yourself, maybe, and maybe one day have a supervising you become a supervisor or you're like a lead where you're leading a character, and maybe one day a director like yourself. But like there is a long path, and it a lot of it is um it is overlapping your time at work in a, in a guaranteed way where you are definitely working in some, some way like hand in hand with someone who's more, has more experience than you. And then 3d doesn't really have that juniors have to kind of get, they get thrown into the mix and they hope to hell that they have a supervisor that takes the time out of, their, out of their day to help them in a similar way. But it's just not the same because you're not working with them necessarily. I'm curious your thoughts on that and what, what ways have you kind of come up with inevitably to try to solve that gap can, can, you know, considering your, your background. Yeah, that's yeah. You, I think you're you're super right on all counts there. And in, in um, when I switched over to CG, you know, I almost quit because <laughs> it's such a hard transition for me. No, for seriously, sure. it, was, it was very difficult for me. For some, it was far easier. For me, it wasn't. And there's a lot of really patient people at DreamWorks, um, you know, uh, who helped me through. But I, I think the the nature of animation studios in Los Angeles uh, in Orlando where I was for, for Disney Florida. Um, there's kind of a, an accepted and well uh, tried and tested system of mentorship. Hmm. So it's not uncommon for someone to mentor someone else. It's, it's less formal than it used to be. It's yeah. less overt than it was in terms of like taking you under my wing at Disney. Like that is what that place was about. Mm -hmm. But nowadays, uh, especially with, especially in Montreal with studios proliferating at like an alarming rate, That's true. Uh, That's the, majority, the majority of studios becoming, you know, uh, a new model of kind of client vendor, uh, studios will sell the art part of the studio, the craft part, 
And yet really what's emphasized in the background is the trade part. Mm. And I think, of course, it's necessary. You need to hit your quota to be a professional animator. You know, that's necessary. Sorry out there. <laughs> um, you have to meet your deadlines. You have to show often. You have to like report in and get feedback and just to be a pro. But I think that the craft side is often neglected at the cost of that. Because really, when do you, when are you able to take the time? You know, like there's no animator out there that doesn't want mentorship unless there's, you know, I'm sure there are some people who think they can make it through on their own and good luck to you, I guess. But um, it needs to be built in because yeah, exactly. psychologically part of the job. Well, yeah, exactly. Because psychologically, if the studio is saying amazing, you're hitting your quota and you're doing a great mm. job and you're even exceeding maybe your quota, mm. then what is your association to being a, a successful animator? It becomes like being very proficient, but the yeah. artistic sides for your friends to go like, wow, you're doing cool shots. Yeah. Maybe the acknowledgement on occasion, if you are, are anointed a superstar, and I really detest that. Like it's <laughs> something in me that I, I have a really, really hard time with. Um, you know, luckily where I started in Montreal at Latelier An mm -hmm. Animation, it was kind of a blank sheet for me. And they're like, just go do your thing. And yeah. I had a lot of support there. And so I was just kind of experimenting because who am I to say like, oh, you know, certain parts of Disney and DreamWorks, I wasn't super happy about how they treated like full-fledged animators in the sense that you know people will be quickly identified as a certain type of animator and relegated to a mm. certain role yeah and everyone's so professional of course they'll do it but i just don't think you're taking full advantage you've got the world's best animators yeah. you know but it's played in a different kind of mentality and but i'm like i came here i'm like who am i to say i've never done mm -hmm. it and so I just tried because at worst they would fire me and <laughs> I got to try it. it. Um, but it does work when you basically give, you give, you evaluate who you have mm. and you give everyone an equal shot at good material, but you give people support and you're not like, Oh, you got an acting shot. Oh man, you better not blow it because you know, there's like that weird false, idea that you know obviously someone gets a body mechanic shot really tough action shot you're like okay that's going to take them some time yeah and yet they have a close-up you're like well you're not animating hands or feet you better smoke this or you're not getting another one that's absurd mm -hmm. you know you're talking about the the pinnacle yeah. of difficulty in animation is yeah. emotional performance and so but you also can't leapfrog someone to a triple a shot if they're brand new but you provide them material that that can build in the proper way with the proper support. That way people, uh, artists can feel like they can make mistakes yeah. and that they can learn and they can stumble and not hit a deadline because they're having a hard time and they don't feel singled out and they don't feel like uh, a disproportionate amount of pressure in succeeding for a shot that they shouldn't be quite doing yet. Mm -hmm. you know? And I think secondly, there has to be an outright commitment made to animators like at my new studio now at um dneg dneg feature animation here in montreal brand fresh studio um i've spoke to them about it and it was one of the mandates for my two bosses um tom and dp they said hey look you know we want like ongoing education to be a thing mm. how about it? i'm like yes yeah. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like but what that means though because i've heard that before I yeah. said, if you really mean that, it's got to be more than one master class every yeah. four months to inspire exactly. people. Because yeah. as inspiring as it is, you don't really take away anything that you can apply right away. And so yeah. what we've decided to do is that we uh, are going to do one large master class every other month and two smaller ones uh, in the months in between. And so we're building material to do that, but during work hours. Mm. Not yeah, at lunch. It's, Not like it's, you're gonna I learn mean, at lunch. You're yeah. gonna learn after after work. And like that's it. Yeah, because then the students yeah. aren't really investing in that at that point. They're kind of the 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 animators have to. 
Yeah. Right? And that, that's something that's not easy to implement. It, it needs no. to come from the studio because, uh, as you said, uh, Ted, I've also heard that often. But the reality mm -hmm. is that, you know, whoever the head of studio or owner or co-founder is has the best intention, the reality is everyone at some point is on a payroll is a, and on a spreadsheet somewhere and there's deadline yeah. and there's pressure exactly. and the producer that is pressured to ship that movie for that time and is already late by and, and he's trying to find how uh, are, are we going to to make it he's yeah. not the one who's going to say oh yeah yeah you can take an entire day for the like, training for the, yeah. Yeah. for the training no problem yeah it's never go, go, exactly. go, go, going to happen so it yeah. needs to to come from the studio and yep. everyone totally. who's in charge of their own team needs to understand why for the long term that that's a you know constant time investment for the long term and the benefit of the uh, of the studio and everyone totally. that's working at the studio totally agree the reason why i asked you this too ted just a little bit of a little bit of context like i i've i've had the pleasure of teaching a lot of people here in the local area and a lot of those people had gone on to actually work for ted and and ted's you know so I, this is the moment of the conversation where i, I talk about you like you're not here ted is ted, <laughs> ted had he developed a bit of a reputation for being that guy like this the people people like the, the brand that he had created was you go to l'atelier animation so you can work on on a high quality feature film but also so you can grow as an animator because ted puts mm -hmm. that as a really big priority he's going to find a way and so like you are always cramming in master classes you are always spending time half as a director and half as like a coach like someone who's caring about these people and and their the trajectories that they're that they're on and not a, you're not going to get supervisors like that all the time i can tell you that right now and part of the problem is like what david's saying is it does well, both Ted, David and Ted were saying this, it does require a high level commit for, commitment from the studio. So when you're looking for a studio and you're an, a young animator, that should be high on the list of things to be looking for is, are you going to be in a position to learn? Not just time to cram things, and you will learn a lot from production, but like you will learn even more if you're actually, you have the room to grow as an artist as well. So I'm, yeah. I was just curious. I wanted to pick your brain on it because you you you, you said you don't know you, you you had never did it before, and you weren't too sure if you were just going to try it and get fired. But like whatever you were doing was working because people were lining up out in front of your door to get a spot on one of those productions, and there's a reason for that. Yeah, you know, I mean, thank you for saying that. I just wanted to be, I wanted to treat others like I would prefer to be treated. I think it kind of comes down to that. I think. Uh, there's not a whole, I mean, let's face it, you know, like I'm not James Baxter or Glenn or Mark or any of these people that's going to leave a lasting legacy in terms of their work. I'm proud of my work for me. And I think I did a great job for the film, hopefully. And I can take away something, my own artistic growth, but that's kind of the limitations of it. So in the context of that idea, then what do you leave others? Mm. Like for me, I think you have to leave a legacy of helping others to improve, to continue to pass that on yeah. and to grow a community in a city like Montreal beyond like a biomass that of animators that moves from studio to mm. studio. I think that it's time now, like after seven, eight years to have a, a studio where you can have people go, wait, this is your last stop for a while. Mm -hmm. you know, like we're going to provide you everything that you need here and that you would want to stay at. And so I think like our commitment to, you know, from the top down uh, to put aside time, work time for education is one thing. And in fact, mm -hmm. I just, Friday is going to be my fourth and final lecture for the rigging and modeling departments because, you know, like we want that those teams to kind of be as one, you know, you've all worked and the truth is like, um, the truth is like you have departments that, that don't communicate as well sometimes. And we really like how things are going, but moving forward, we want to bind them even more. So uh, giving those departments lectures that are outside of their technical like uh, constraints. Yeah. And to talk about squash and stretch yeah. and animation dynamics and yeah, shape sure. and design and this last moment beyond acting. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's really, it's, it takes a lot of commitment, like you said, company wise, um, but it's going to happen. So excited about that. And hopefully yeah. what I was able to try out at Atelier continues here, but on a higher level. 
Well, it's it's commitment, but it's also I think expertise and being able to relay the information. I think not everyone's so great at that. So I think you you you. It sounds like you're at a place where you it's kind of the perfect storm where you, we have you have someone like yourself who's dedicated and driven to do these things and has a lot of experience doing it, and a company who's like. We're going to give you the room. We're going to give you the budget. Let's do it. Yeah, awesome. yeah. Uh, and, I, and I think the extra benefit of it is is just the ripple effect that it has mm -hmm. in a CD come uh, yeah, like, like Montreal because because I, I agree with you, Brent. That that's the same word of mouth that we were hearing yeah. out of uh, exactly. l'atelier, and th so there is a new, uh, at least a new group of animators that will yeah. now be expecting that. Exactly. Oh wait, you're you're not investing in in, in our own growth o o over here. Why? Yeah. And just bringing those questions because you exactly. know in Montreal and in most of of the cities where there's a very dynamic uh, uh, animation industry, uh, people are moving around. Yep. So an, a, a so it That's can it. so if you're exactly. able to create this little Exceed. beacon of whatever yeah. there for a sustained period of time, then those people will cross pollinate uh, in other exactly. places and that kind of we. we we see this all the time, right? The companies like it tends to like because the people are there, because I mean, it's not, it's not, it's not just people expectation, but a lot of the like a number of of Ted's previous uh, animators have gone on to start supervising themselves, and so now yeah. you have these people that have now not only got that level of of of. Um, it's it's like it's like parenting, right? It's like you are like kids model your own behavior. So when, then when their parents, hopefully, if you've if your parents were were loving and they were caring and supportive, is a much highly um, um, uh, the the likelihood of you also then developing to be a parent that's similar to that is high. And so it's the same mm -hmm. thing, right? So like Ted, in in a position like that, you can sort of philosophically create this seed idea that can transcend way beyond your own individual ability to control. Like it just grows beyond that, and you start a movement really like by getting people to think like this and to, to care about more than just the trade but also the craft i hope so yeah. and if, if anything were to if anyone took anything away from what i taught them i would hope that fairness is probably it because i think you know being fair is kind of tough a lot of people are indoctrinated into okay if you're going to give someone notes you got to be nice first and then you got to tell them the bad part and you got to be nice at the end I'm like, why are you treating them like a child? Like mm. <laughs> this is a motivated professional person with tons of desire. You just be honest and fair when they're not holding up their end of the bargain. You know, you give people trust and support, but there's accountability. Yeah. You know, you, they don't get let off the hook because I have a very high standard. And, and I think that's part of what people buy into as well. And if they slip, it's your responsibility on the flip side of giving them support that they don't get away with stuff or at least you there's more in somebody like there's no use in pushing someone beyond their current level of growth but you always have to put a demand on them to get more out of their ceiling yeah because they're not because otherwise they're not growing right that's really it and yeah. so I, I i hope like i what's nice about uh dneg right now is that the barrier of entry obviously is a little higher than yeah. Latelier, but now the mentorship, I get to also grow the level mm. of the mentorship. Mm. So it's not fundamentally about basic spacing, you know, but it's really mm. more high concept ideas. Mm. So I'm working on a lecture now. I, I, I'm at like five and a half hours of material that's sequential mm. that I put together that I'm trying to like compress and and make a little bit more bite size or i'll break it into two but it it's really designed to challenge high concept mm. and your ability to go away going like you mm. know not as confused as tenant watching tenant hopefully <laughs> um <laughs> yeah, i haven't but, recovered from that <laughs> <laughs> but something, something like that you know where you're leaving you're like, I, I think i liked it i didn't understand it and then <laughs> well, well, one day when you're animating it'll hit you where it it'll sink in you know um, <laughs> but what's what's interesting? Uh, I feel that what you've done uh, naturally at Latelier was a combination of your both your experience at Disney and DreamWorks of what you enjoyed there and what you felt was an issue to be fixed. The fact that you were teaching for at least fifteen years and the fact that you arrived and like, oh clean slate i guess that yeah. i need to figure out how this job is done because it's the first time that i'm do doing it so well i'm a fairly good teacher i'm a good communicator uh i you know 
I'm going to uh, start recruiting and I'm going to do what I think I should be doing. And no one is going to be in my way, uh, uh, hopefully. So, and that's kind of what it uh, it, it became. So that that's super interesting. Yeah, I couldn't I couldn't have said it better. Like that's exactly it. And uh, and you know, I also got very lucky because uh, a fledgling studio like Latelli at the time, that kind of uh, chemistry can exist only for a short period. By by its own nature, it can't stay that way. But I also happened to land like a tremendous crew of animators, like the biomass happened to land on me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it well, was... that, 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 sorry to interrupt, that's definitely something I'm curious about, because now you have a reputation on Montreal of, you know, wherever Ted is going to go, you have <laughs> masses Herpes. of animators that uh, you're going to absorb animators from all <laughs> over the place. Like studio are scared when they know that you're wrapping up on a new <laughs> production. So how, and definitely it's not like you have 20 years of experience of recruiting. It was something right. that, you know, by nature was new to you. Yeah. So what's, what's the secret recipe <laughs> to, <laughs> to be able yeah. to be that Come successful? On, share the wealth, recruiting. man. Jeez. Uh, yeah. Well, I don't know. I, I just think that, um, I don't put too much stock in a demo reel. Like I think what I want to build beyond like a, a group of tremendous artists is a tremendous group of people that are great artists. And it's really essential to make sure that as much as you humanly can, you make sure the values of the people that you're bringing in align with those of my own and thus the studios. Uh, if, you know, I'm building the studio here and continuing to echo that um, culture in in London as well, there's a fantastic group of young animators there and some really great uh, animation directors. And to be able to sustain that, it's very, again, like you said, Brent, the timing is very lucky for me, like it was with Latelier. I don't know how much credit I could take because... For instance, there's certain studios in Montreal that came from the ground up, yeah. already had a pre-existing studio in the US or somewhere, but then they got a show and they're like, we got to go now. We need mm -hmm. 90, 100 animators now. You can only filter so far. It reminds right. me of movies where you see like a Wild West town explode oh, yeah. because there's gold. Totally. Gold rush. You cannot control who's coming no. in there. No, you can't. And guess what? It's pretty hard to get them out after you set up, yeah. right? Because they yeah. entrench themselves, they take advantage, and then this internal subcultures, none of that. Like, I despise politics. Mm -hmm. I despise um, nepotism. Uh, I, I think people maybe come to me because they think I'll be fair with them, and, and I just care about them growing. And so mm -hmm. I guess the key is my interviews is probably if there's like a secret, it's like mm. they're long and really elaborate. Uh, and depending on what I feel I'm getting back from the artist or not, I have questions that are set to throw them either off balance or to kind of pull more out of them. And I think 90% of the time, I'm pretty certain, even if people are like, but the demo reel, man, I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> like they've they've got it yeah they've got it and you know i always try to pull in whether you're a junior or mid or a senior or lead or whatever trying to always pull in people who think and punch like above their weight mentally and and personality wise are great to get along with um yeah uh, on the flip side, what would you say someone that would come in with a experience and super strong showreel that would mm -hmm. take you, you know, you're like, nope, sorry, sorry, recruiting department on paper, he's a superstar, mm -hmm. but I do, I, we will not have him on our team. What, what was the question? Uh, so what would be the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 either the traits of personality or you oh, know, whatever uh, would happen during this interview that would make you put the break and say, no, sorry, amazing show real experience, but I'm, I do not have this guy or girl or, on my team. Let me guess. Well, you I, guess it's, it comes down to the hockey team, right? Yeah. No? You, okay. you, are you a fan I knew of it. the Leafs? I knew it. If the, if you're a fan of the Leafs, <laughs> that's uh, it. You're out. Please take your things. Thank you for your time. <laughs> um, yeah, no, uh, 
I've had people actually come in and state right right off the bat, like, I want to be supervisor. Uh, is there any spot for that? Or I want to be lead. Um, and it's good in the sense that you state what you want. There's nothing mm -hmm. wrong with that. I, I believe like it's okay. Like it, you state what you want. That's good. However, traits of self-centeredness, closed-mindedness, um, uh, a worldview on animation mentorship that is born out of ego rather than of selflessness. You know, when you start hearing comments like, oh, yeah, you know, and I want to start doing lectures and I think I'm a great mentor. Like, I don't I think the person that you were helping is the best judge of that. You know, <laughs> I don't know. I of, of all things, I think that's the last place where you should be stating success, because how can you state success when that yeah. person's growth is like 10, 20 years long? Yeah. You know, you're just helping them with a couple of steps, like on that road, like, you you know, so to be as to have like three years of experience, you're like, I'm teaching and like, I'm like, really? Okay. <laughs> Everyone has something to share, but why are you doing that? Why? Like, why That's are you motivation. building your career that way? It's mm -hmm. kind of, it's a fine thing, but the, but usually with a really killer demo reel, uh, the things that turn me off, I, I'll do my homework and I'll call around town and I'll get a large enough sample size and people know I'm kind of a straight shooter. And if I if I hear from one person that they're great and another person they're a jerk, I can't decide on that. But if 10 people are like, and generally those 10 people will kind of just pause. I'll go, so what do you think about so-and-so? And they'll go, that's enough from the people that I'm asking. <laughs> I actually remember you calling me for one of those. Hey, you know this guy? I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah, I and can testify that know. there is some background check going on. <laughs> yeah, an animator should know because you've done the same for me. You're like, mm -hmm. so what do you think of this person? I'm like, I don't know. Or this person, yes. And for anyone listening, you have to understand that they're not conversations where you're like, no, never take that guy. You know, haha. <laughs> it's not, it's never about that. Actually, it's, very professional most of those conversations you're like yeah you know what like they're good at this and this but because of this and this and this i don't know if they'd be a good fit for you and and that's that's usually how long the conversation takes less than five minutes and that's why when you go out there you have to understand that just because you're at one studio if you don't you know mind your p's and q's that you'll have a great time at another studio you're going to run out of studios eventually Oh yeah, for and, sure. And, and then you're doing, you know, portraits in old Montreal. So you know, <laughs> yeah, we're we're often saying that it, it however, it, it's booming. It's still a small industry. Why? Because we kind of all know each other, and we, there's you know, there's always some background check. And sometimes it can be super, it can be negative or super positive. Like, hey, I only three years of experience, but pretty. You know, great personality, strong show, real. Oh yeah, she she killed it on, on the show and all that. You're like, okay, thank you it. for confirming my assumption, and that's and, it. And, and that's it. You know, and also like people can smell when something's funny. Like I often get calls from people too, where they're like, so everything on paper <laughs> looks amazing, but I got a funny feeling and I can't put my finger on it. Mm. Do you have that funny feeling? And I'm like, yeah, for sure like funny feeling hundred percent don't, you know? Uh, yeah. yeah, it's, it's very tricky. You just, and it's not that hard. Yeah. You just really put your nose to the grindstone. You'd be a good person. You work really hard and that's kind of what it comes down to. Yeah. You, you, you don't know why, but you know, maybe the fact that we've been on, on top of, you know, human were expert at analyzing faces and trying to figure out what's going on. And we're kind of, our bullshit radar is always on. But on top of that, we're animators that analyze, you know, performance and facial expression and <laughs> yeah, all that. True. So I feel that our, you know, our, our sensibility on, on bullshit is slightly above uh, uh, average. Yeah. So I, I agree that often you have this 
when you do have this feeling, most of the time, it's yeah, uh, there's strong a intuition. You know, the big takeaway here for me is is this idea, and it's, it's it seems like there's a theme here, which is interesting, is that you're playing the long game, Ted, by the sounds of it. And I think I'll, I, I'd like to see a lot more studios sort of play the same kind of long game. And then what I mean by that is, like, this philosophy you have when it comes to, like, look, I need to see their demo rail to the point where I know that they actually have some skill in this, Absolutely. some potential to be good, but you can you can invest in that long term you can invest in someone who's got a good uh, but you can't if the if the if the quality of their person is 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 fundamentally flawed that is something you cannot fix not at least easily without some sort of psychological or psychiatric intervention and i mean and you're, and not, obviously, and you're not going to do it over the period of one no, production no you're not and so and so like the idea of trying to build a team which is what you're interested in doing clearly you're you're you are you are you, you you're looking at it long term but also kind of the short medium term where there's like there's a production here so i need to have at least a team that can support one another and get that done but i'm looking for the next after that and after that because by that point i'll have such a well oil machine of people that are like literally able to like they're it's at that point they are the chemistry is 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 sort of like galvanized and you can probably do just about anything this this idea of the long game is interesting and i think it looks sounds like you found a really good home at dna because it sounds like they want to invest in the same kind of long game as you do which is yeah absolutely because cool. the career path is like you know mentorship like the the one thing that was frustrating at l'atelier and it's not their fault at all uh is the fact that i'd train a bunch of people and then they leave yeah. Like, and, and ultimately I don't mind because after ballerina, we had one person go to blue sky, uh, two people go to Disney, um, one person to Sony. So all that, I know that place is, is just a temporary stop. Yeah. Yeah. But now at this studio with the material that we're getting in, I'm like, well, why not look after people's career paths? And so yeah. they can come talk to me and say, Hey, you know what? Yeah. Not now, but what do you think about being a lead next show? Mm -hmm. I'm like, sure, let's talk about it. Or if you're yeah. serious, we could sit down and break down what you need to work on, yeah. what you're good at that you could really, you know, push. And then <laughs> God we'll, we'll, yeah. God forbid they're ready for that, right? Like so many people yeah. are so interested in that supervising job and then they get there and are like, oh, it's not just more money. Oh, what? Yeah. What? I don't just get all the money shots and all the money now. What's what? Yeah. I, what? Soft skills? What are those? Yeah. yeah. Bidding, you know, yeah. like, yeah, sodas, exactly. like the unfun stuff that you don't yeah. see, but that's crucial. Yeah. You know, like planning, working yeah. with different departments, you know, like and not being and really kind of shedding that idea that to be a cool animator, you have to be like an us versus them with production. Mm -hmm. That's like the way of the dodo, you mm -hmm. know, like it just doesn't work. And the better like everyone can work together. Uh, what people don't get is production. They have their job to do and you need to dispel the myth of like the flaky prima donna animator and be collaborative and then guess what? You can help them and they can help you. It's essential to making it through and feeling like sane at the end of the production, you know, because that's the thing, like what I'm trying to also try to do, and I don't know, I hope it works, but I think it's um, the one thing that yourself and David and, and myself have had in the past is long contracts with seemingly no ending. Mm. And what that does is it gives you, it relieves the pressure of, of the unknown in mm -hmm. a year. Yeah. And so your normal outside life has a chance to settle down. And when that's settled down and balanced, your work is more balanced. And, you know, of course, in, in a situation like, like with DNA feature or any other studio around town, with the exception, you know, of the two features at L'Atelier that were produced in house, um, it's, it's tough, but if you if we're working really, really hard to align projects to give people not only an opportunity to kind of keep going with their contracts, but yeah. also to go like, you know what? I did, I worked on a cartoony type show. I don't need to leave to work on like a, a more naturalistic show or a really edgy show. And you give people a choice. So, you know, between London and Montreal and Mumbai, you could find something that you're happy on, which is the whole point is like being happy. Like people forget, you know, that animation finds you <laughs> and not the other way around. Yeah. And it, it draws you away from a life that you feel that isn't there for you entirely. That's not satisfying you. And then you find like you're doing animation in your spare time and then you're 
family and friends are wondering where you've disappeared to. And, <laughs> and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, I'm going to take this seriously. But all of that feeling, your animation looked terrible when you started. But why <laughs> did you choose to devote your life to it? Because it gave you a feeling that was indescribable to almost everyone else. And when you met people like you who understood, it was special and you felt like, this is my community, this is my world. But people forget that's why they're there after a while, sometimes. you know. And the ones that make it through, I think, happier than ever um, are the ones who constantly remind themselves they're pretty lucky to be making a living at it, you know? And that they make the best of it. There's like uh, a pall of negativity that forms quite quickly in studios. It's easy to jump on board and, and get on the negative train, but it takes mm -hmm. just as much energy to be to look at the good side of it. And I'm not saying pretend that rigs aren't w w like working and that's fine, or you're behind or you're doing overtime and that's okay. I'm saying recognize it, but you know, complaint is designed to get things resolved but it's meant to happen over a short term so you could be positive again. But I think some people thrive on the negativity because whether it's a, a way to cope with stress or it's a weird type of bond that you have with others, I would, I'm trying to build a team that can withstand stresses and go mm -hmm. through that normal dip of negativity to kind of reemerge and be positive about it. Because when a happy animator is doing a scene, it shows. Like it shows so much when someone's having fun, even if it's like technically executed and beautifully, beautifully done. If the person wasn't happy and their heart's not there, there's going to be something missing from it. <laughs> Which you, you, you've been talking about uh, uh, stress and, and and I know that you've been uh, dealing with your uh, fair share of, you know, uh, anxiety as well as we, as we all do at various level. And I, and if I can throw in other Ted T anecdote that, that, that I remember as well. And sorry, Brent, for talking about the ad for 30 seconds. Uh, but I remember that at some point we were looking at an abs game. It was the playoffs. It was at my place. Oh, no. And I'm you literally you literally couldn't watch it. It was too stressful. So you were in my <laughs> backyard and I was reporting back what is <laughs> going on because it was just too much. <laughs> so, that, that. But uh, anxiety is something that we, we uh, often feel. So first of all, how, how did you dealt with it yourself? And when you see in your team that some people have mm -hmm. anxiety that gets out of control in the sense that, yeah, at times it's it's normal. It's part of, you know, uh, how we be, uh, behave and all that. But if it's sustained, it's super unhealthy and it's mm -hmm. not helping you. It's not helping your coworker. It's not helping your work. So how how did you learn to deal with it yourself? And how do you help others in your team to, to deal with it? For me, I think... Um... You know, being in the L.A. environment, I think it's kind of sink or swim. Uh, you have to deal with your anxiety because it's, you know, <laughs> DreamWorks is like the highest level and everyone was kind to a person. Um, but at the same time, you know, like it's all A-list people. And I think everyone is um, everyone's such an A-type generally that, you know, goes into actual the animation department, you know, uh, that your expectations for yourself are always higher than anyone else's. And mm -hmm. that's the that's how anxiety gets generated at those studios. But it's a different anxiety in Montreal. It's one that's born out of where am I going to get my next gig? Yeah, insecurity. How am I doing? Um, that person's a lead already. Why am I not a lead? Um, you know, am I going to get good shots? What's my pay going to be? Because I think that's a reflection of who I am. There's a lot of um, factors that I've seen anxiety build around, and it really comes down to a handful of things. Uh, one, it's always obvious, it's obvious to determine the source of the anxiety. If you generalize someone's anxiety as one that you have yourself, you're instantly going to let that person down. Totally. I think the big thing is you can't gloss over it. I think depending on the person, it could be as little as going like stopping them like, hey, you doing all right? You don't mm -hmm. seem all right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some people will be like, okay. And by the okay, you're like, no. And you pull them aside or they go, okay. And you're like, okay, you're all right. But it takes like, I know my animators really, really well. 
But oftentimes you go, okay, so what is it? And you make it to the next step. Sometimes it's obvious because everyone is, everyone has anxiety. So you're like, okay, it's, you know, technology related, it's schedule related, uh, it's COVID related, you know, personal okay, life related. Yeah. And that's one thing, but to, to be able to understand the source of the stress helps you deal with it. So for me, uh, I think sitting down and going like, Hey, what's, what's going on here? Tell me, just be honest with me. And really like almost 10 out of 10 times, people have been really straight with me either in one conversation or three where they slowly, I have to like kind of reel it out or let them come to me. And I think it's uh, important to identify the fact that other people on the team have their back. You know, um, a very valuable lesson I learned is that you'd never leave anyone hanging. Yeah, exactly. I mean, someone is struggling and they're mm -hmm. starting to, and pe production's coming and going, hey, you know, their foot is really tanking the last few weeks. What can you do? Can, should we talk to them? I'm like, no, give me a chance. Mm -hmm. But they know it more than anyone that they're not performing. Yeah, so you go, sure. look, we got to do two things here. We got to figure out what's causing this. And secondly, if one of them is that you feel like you're letting your teammates down or you're not holding up your end of the bargain and that you're going to get in trouble or whatever it is, that's gone because so-and-so and so-and-so will pick up your footage this week. It's going to be hard for them, but they'll do it because you're you. And yeah. we're, a, we're like, we're a team and we look out for each other. One day you'll be asked to do the same. Exactly. But right now, don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. Other things are questions of self-doubt. You know, they get into a, like, you know, animators are so demanding of themselves and they hit a dip. They just feel like their trajectory is going to be like this once they get a good scene. And sometimes that happens. You see animators that just like everything works and they just like launch into the stratosphere. I hate those people. <laughs> I mean, I well, do. Sorry, I should know, speak to I, anybody else. I, I think what comes around goes around. So you hope that it happens to you. So I wish them luck. You know, I'm like, go, go, like skyrocket as much as you can. Yeah. Um, and I hope it keeps going. But for those, the majority of animators, juniors, um, looking to catch a break, um, or veterans who have become too complacent, you know, like you need to always be on top of, of, your game and to be honest with it that to people that will listen i think for animators you need to assess carefully what your stress is and to be honest about it to someone who could make a difference and then and then it all starts there it's just a conversation it's just some time off it's just uh, backing some scenes off so they feel a little less pressure and then bringing those scenes back to know that <clears throat> because of their anxiety, they don't lose their good material. You'll relieve them of the pressure, let them catch up, let them get their feet under themselves again and catch a breath. And then you bring them back in. I think that's how we, I, ma I manage it anyway. And I talk to production. It's important that they understand that they'll be okay because I can talk and go, they'll be fine. We'll make up the footage. And then everywhere, I've, at L'Atelier where I worked, everyone was so understanding and equally so, if not more at, at DNEG so far. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's really where it, it makes a big difference to have those uh, self skills as a supervisor yeah. or director or just leader in general to yes, animation, yes, the computer, the software, the quota, Excel and all that. But <clears throat> at some point, it, it's, it's not even about any of this. It's just about understanding this other human being, <laughs> being uh, uh, empathetic of what they're going through and be able to just, you know, take them aside and talk things things true yeah but equally on the other side you know i i think um people can also forget that you know you can carry a certain attitude but just because you think it's right doesn't mean it's right yeah you know mm -hmm. and they also get a talk from me that's not as pleasant <laughs> uh i i just think that you know people need to be held accountable you can't yeah. act like a child on on a on a proper team yeah. you know that's an important element, though, like is it what you're doing is you're supporting those people who need support and you you need to help guide those who might need a little bit of a a little bit of a lesson on humility or on on just being a bit better of a human. I think the tricky thing is like the other thing that and a lot of people have a hard time relating to this outside of an artistic field. But, you know, this is the thing, right? The bane of animators are typically animators are 
a bunch of things. They're, 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 we're very different. Every animator is their own person, but we fall into a similar category, even though, you know, there's extroverted animators and there's introverted animators. But one thing we all have in common is we all tend to be highly sensitive individuals. There's a reason for that. It's because it kind of comes in, it's packaged with our highly um, acute observational skills, right? Like if we were not naturally observant people, we would be terrible at this job. And unfortunately, those observations lead to overthinking and self-doubt and all these other things that become kind of the plague of an animator. And it uh, takes a lot of coaching and people that, you know, it's, it's, it, I think putting yourself out there as a supervisor, like you do, Ted, it helps because it immediately disarms them because they're like, Oh wow. Okay. So you struggle with this stuff too. Yeah. Damn. I'm a, like, yes, we all do. We're all <laughs> in this together. Like, so like, I mean, maybe you can learn a little bit from my experience and, but you know, I got your back. You're here on this team for a reason. You're valuable and don't worry. We're not, I'm not going to bail on you. Let's do this together. Let's figure it out. I think it's so key because of that like you said that the the um like just feeling like maybe the team doesn't have your back and that can feel yeah. like that's bad when it, when people literally start thinking that that's when it's downhill unless someone intervenes and lets them re reminds them that no actually no yeah and you know i think even if it's elements like self-doubt and not feeling like you're fast enough or yeah. you're doing well enough i think those types of problems are really healthy for an animator to learn to contend with because that's your bread and butter. What I don't think you ought to contend with is poor treatment, uh, any kind of bullying, yeah. being subject to, to a group of people who just cast according to who their friends are, uh, you know, and then being mistreated. You know, it's just that that I I think is outside of what you should have to deal with. If you have that anxiety, you yeah. are powerless to remove it. Totally. So, you know, not having that to begin with at least kind of contains what anxiety you have and whether it's within the bounds of your job or not, you know. Yeah, exactly. Well, this is where fairness comes into play. So it's create a safe environment and be fair with everyone that goes in it. And, and being fair some, sometimes goes both ways. If you have someone yep. that struggles for a consistent period of time, don't keep giving them a shot because first of all you might fear their feed their own anxiety yeah and what message do you send to all the others that are doing all they can to pr produce yeah. good, good work so maybe it's time to lower a little bit the level of difficulty of the shots to allow them to slowly climb back up to Absolutely. a place that they feel confident because confidence is making all the difference I i've seen animators that they, they went from being rock star to struggle with very mm -hmm. end confidence was a huge part oh, of, yeah. uh, of it yeah. and they were and they eventually came back to to, to their game and you know it, it's hard to understand why and how long it's going to to to, to take but uh yeah I I inspiration is a very elusive way to uh, to get and no no matter how skilled you uh, you are that's that's for sure yeah, yeah and I'll pick them quickly yeah, I think too, Dave, what you're saying too, <clears throat> like bringing them up, like we talked about with their shots, slowly backing them off so they, they can have less pressure. I think the important part about that though, is to make that an open discussion to go, look, this is what's going to be happening. Yeah. This mm -hmm. is why this is happening. Yeah. And this is when you get back on your feet, this is yes. what should happen. Yes. Yeah. Because what's the reason of providing exactly. those easier shots instead of, oh shit, I suck now. So I'm well, just giving it. those poor shots. Yeah. Well, no, it's because we want to help you to bring you back up to what yeah, we know exactly. you can provide. Or the feeling of having a shot taken away from you, it could lead to people going, oh my God, I'm failing. And it's like, well, no, you're not. I have to take this away from you because it needs to get done, but it's not a, it's not a punishment. It is, well, I'm trying to help. You know what I mean? I totally agree that this is, it's, it's funny. Even sometimes the solution to try to fix a problem could add even further anxiety to the poor animator who's like literally like in a, in a, in a, in a tizzy at that moment. Right. Yeah. And in the mm -hmm. situation that you specifically talked about, Brent, where you have to take a shot from someone, that's like the, one of the hardest things for sure that you could ever do. But for sure. <clears throat> I guarantee you beyond the pride and the feeling of letting the team down and me down or whomever down, they're relieved to let that shot go. Yeah, deep and down somewhere for deep sure. inside they're relieved and it's not a bad thing it's nothing no. to be ashamed about and you know you just have to reassure them and you're like look it happens to everybody yeah and and it's just a question especially in montreal where you just got to get stuff done sometimes uh but you just have to inform them because at studios i've been you know like dave you're saying 
there's a lot of great, mostly great things. But in the few things that I didn't like on that level is that quiet conversations happen behind closed doors and your fate is decided and mm -hmm. that you're kind of placated with a pat on the back because they feel that's the way to get you the least upset that causes the least ripples. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been doing this a long time. I'd rather you be up front with me and oh, let yeah. me see, let me handle it. Yep. You know? Yeah. Because yeah. you can, you can, that way you can deal with it rather than fear about, uh, about a bunch of boogeyman sure. conversations that may or may not even be happening. Right. Which ge yeah. generally were happening, but you know, yeah. like, <laughs> exactly. I hate how you're, you're kind of treated like what, mm -hmm. what conversations? There's no conversation. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. You know, it's another thing that another factor in all of this too, I, I would be, you know, I would be remiss to not mention that part of this is also sometimes these anxieties come from previous experiences. They may sure. not have had an experience where they have a, a, a supervisor like you who puts themselves out there and like says, look, I'm here for you because you're part of my team. And if you can't succeed, then the team doesn't succeed. So like, I'm here for you. Like, that's my job. But not everyone gets that. Some get, some people get people that is, as we, as we were talking, I think before the, before we went live, this idea of sometimes people, um, you know, getting, you know, there's a habit of in this industry, sadly, depending on the type of culture at a company where people get promoted into positions like lead positions that really don't, they, it's not that they don't deserve it, but it's not like, it's what they think that they want, but it's like, these are, these are very difficult scenarios because you're putting someone, maybe a really great animator and you're putting them into a management like role, you now lose a really good animator and the team gains a really maybe terrible potentially not no for, for no fault of their own maybe because they, they they don't maybe they don't have the skills or maybe they don't have the training like so my point is there are good supervisors out there there are bad supervisors out there i'd like to think that everyone has their you know the best interests at heart but sometimes they don't necessarily know how to do that and you might be coming into another another place and then you have to start all over again and build trust with your new supervisor so you never really know what you're going to get so that's yeah. Another problem. There's kind of like a solved. middle. There's kind of like a middle tier mm -hmm. that's kind of um, formed in Montreal where people have been doing two or three features and they want to lead. Yeah. And there's a big thick layer of leads now. Yeah. That's true. Some of which I feel like it's kind of like, and you know, it's a bit like the martial arts in the sense that um, you know brown belts that should be black belts. Yeah, and you, and you know black belts that should not be anywhere near a black belt. So true. So and true. it's exactly like that. You want to be the blue belt that everyone's like that guy should have been a black belt like last year. Yeah, you know, and that guess what? That guy never had to say or girl never had to say anything, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone around you is saying that you should be up there. Mm -hmm. That's how you want it to go. And you know how that happens? It's because you just cared about what you're doing. You're helping others to get yeah, better. You're constantly it. working on getting better in a positive way yeah. and enjoying it. Yep. Um, yeah. But you know what? That's It's hard because now being a lead has become a weird measure of success. The pay, the... Well, yeah, the it, it, it's not just that. That's a conversation I had at the last studio that I worked uh, uh, with. But and, and as long as you have a financial incentive to become a lead because if it's just junior mid senior lead supervisor and you're a great senior you want to make more money well you have to become a lead and manage right. people now there's many of them that have no interest to manage uh, uh, other people and no natural skills yeah. to, to do it either yeah. but like well i definitely would look forward to this 10 grand raise a year yeah. so all yeah. right i'm going to try this That's lead it. thing and this yeah. is how you you, you have to disconnect at, uh, at yeah. some point those two otherwise yeah. it's th that problem is never going to get fixed but 100%. this comes down to company culture and, and structure as well right and so like people having people like maybe ted that understands these things can you know can help build a team uh, in the and work with the hr department to be able to to, to think about things like ways around that 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 obviously like that 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 ageless problem of of only having the vertical ascension what, what about horizontal promotion what about being someone who just gets more and more experience and gets rewarded for that experience and that 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 loyalty yeah. without having to jump a whole tier into an area that they're a not prepared for b not interested in it's like because yeah. some people people we know that money makes people do dumb things we know this this is we're human right and so including taking a job promotion that deep down they probably know they shouldn't be taken it's crazy yeah and that's why i found it really um unsettling when I arrived in Montreal to find out that, you know, people are asking, are they junior, mid or senior? I go, I don't get it. What does that mean? Yeah. 
And yeah. because in LA and in and, and at yeah. Disney, you're an animator. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. That's it. And your experience got you your pay and your yeah. level got you your pay and there's no discussion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they really don't care if you have six or 20 years of experience. They're they going to judge you based on your character, the quality of your work, how positive influence you have to others, how much you endorse stress, how much this and that. But the question of, oh, is he senior? Because we're about to cast some shows. Yeah. Why does it matter how many years yeah. of experience? Yeah, that's it. Yes, years of experience somehow are among the many things that can make a difference, yeah. but it's one out of 20 things that's, that exactly. are making the difference. Totally agree. But people get obsessed with those titles because it's like a it's a thing, right? I don't. Well, I was told, well and, and, and even and even uh, again, uh, a production sometimes is like, oh, we pay a lot for this individual, so yeah. we we better yeah. get, have a good return on our investment, yeah. so we're going to give a shot. So again, there there's all a connection there yeah. that, that needs to be re, re rethink for uh, yeah. for for sure. Uh, Brent, do you think we'll have time yeah, for a few questions? That's it. I was just literally just going to say exactly this because uh, we're 20 minutes left. So I'd like to, we do have lots. There is a pile of, pile them up here. I'm going to take a couple from the, like, so, because usually what we do for those in chat, what we usually do is we usually give a few days notice. So you know who's going to be coming on the stream. It gives you a chance to actually just send in your questions. You can just oh, you know, cool. add them to add them in the comments. And we have uh, this uh, special um, social animation or so, social media god in the background uh, named Scott. He actually handles all that, collects it all, and we have it ready. But that said, it doesn't mean you can't ask a question in chat. Just I'm not going to be able to get to all the questions. So I'm going to take a couple here that I see that are really interesting. We'll try to field them, and, I'll, and then I'll dig into the chat and uh, see if I can find some more in real time. So uh, the first question, Ted, is... Um, there's a, there's a bunch of really good ones here. Drum um, roll. Yeah, here's a good one. Here, I like this one. So have you seen an animator make a really bad impression on a project? Like, like a first impression? Or maybe even, a, maybe even like maybe they've been around for a while, but they make a bad impression. Um, how, do you, how do you deal with fixing, like as from a lead perspective, who's obviously worried about chemistry, what, what kind of things have you done in the past to maybe help try to solve that problem? Where like a, an <laughs> animator gets a, makes a bad name for themselves. Yeah, you know what? Uh, it's usually uh, a discussion that happens, and it's yeah. usually pretty frank, yeah. you know. But but normally, I I don't assume that it's how I see it, mm -hmm. because they might not know they're doing it. And often, uh, where someone makes a bad example of themselves is that they're unaware. There's a lot of young animators in Montreal, and young, I mean, experience wise or maturity wise, that just have no self awareness. Mm. how they're behaving and so you know i'll pull them aside i'm like hey so do you have any idea at all why i'm talking to you i feel like a cop pulling you someone over and um they're like no i i don't get it i'm like well you you're this <laughs> and this and this and this happened yeah and they're like oh really yeah and if they get defensive i'm like see you're acting like a dick right now yeah exactly and so and, that, and this is why you got pulled over and let's let's talk about not doing that i'm gonna let you off with a warning this time <laughs> You know, uh, so oh, man, but that's that. usually how it goes. <laughs> People who come to work for me know, like, it, it's kind of escapable. I will hear about it or I will see it and it will get attended to. But never in a, in a, in a really harmful way mm -hmm. uh, unless that person's a, an issue distinctly. Uh, and then, that, and then you know, like in any studio, actions can be taken. But yeah. it, rarely, it rarely comes to that. It's yeah. it's funny. You should hand out T-shirts on your first day when they join your team. It just simply says, "Don't be a dick." Like that's it. Don't that's the rule number one: to don't be a dick. That's all yeah. I care about. Yeah. I mean, there's so much doing a, ba a, f a bad first animation can have a, an impact on your. But if that's you're true. again, if you're a dick to others and you're rude or whatever, yeah. e, that that's a big strike one for uh, yeah. anyone. That yeah, would bad animation is rarely going to get a strike against you. We just work yeah. on it. You know, it, it's funny yeah. because. Uh, there's so much, like you said, Brent, uh, of an an attachment to our identity with how we feel our work is. Mm. But sadly, it's not that sexy. You know, it's your animation. If it doesn't work, you fix it. Yeah. And, and it's as much as that. You know, you're like, what doesn't work? You fix it. So there's very little existentialism uh, when it comes to your work. You know, it's just it is what it is and you get it better. And you kind of moderate your highs and lows and you're in for a good time in your career. That's it. Yeah, no, it's good advice. Okay. I got another one here. Uh, this is nice because yep. it kind of ties in nicely with this idea of burnout. Um, uh, no, sorry, not burnout, um, uh, anxiety. 
and uh, and it, it it sort of takes it to the next level. Like when so when you have anxieties and dealing with anxieties, you have people on your team that might be anxious. So we we talked a little bit about recognizing that and possibly even taking uh, steps to help mitigate some of that. But what happens when it goes unaddressed for too long? And this we 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 talk about this thing a lot called burnout. I mean, it's a it's sad that I have to, I say these words and everyone in the industry right away goes, oh yeah, burnout. Wait, that's a thing I know about. And it's because you know about it personally or you know someone you're close to who's experienced it. So I'm just curious, like thoughts on this, like uh, it's, it's, it gets to the heart of the matter. I'm curious if you have any you know personal experiences or just like ideas in general surrounding the topic of burnout. How did you avoid it? How do you detect it? How do you, how do you build yourself back up like the bionic man after it maybe happens to you? Yeah, it's really tricky because often burnout, I've seen people burn out on one of my shows because they were in the afterburn of their last show. Mm. You know, they come on thinking, okay, I've, I've jumped to another island, I'm good. And then it hits them and then they're cooked. And I feel awful because you know why? They showed the best of who they could be. Yeah. And they worked and they put in their best. And largely burnout, I hate to say it, I'm going to point some fingers. It, it's a studio thing. Mm -hmm. And it's due to poor planning, oh, yeah. uh, a lack of care, uh, a lack of support. And a kind of like indifference to how people feel at the end of the production. Yeah. Like, you know, they get blinded and they just see numbers and it's often not a production person's fault. It, it's more than that. It's higher than that. But it's about the priorities that that are set. And in planning a film, you have to build in how it's going to affect people physically and emotionally, not just when you're going to deliver. And I think when you consider you take into consideration all of those factors, you kind of nip it in the bud. And for people who do um, encounter burnout, you have to understand there's nothing shameful in it. Every everyone has a limit that you hit, and you know as you get more experience, you know when you're approaching that threshold and you back off. Um, but some people who are especially young animators, because they have the energy, they have the drive they feel like it's a badge of honor. Yeah. It's a badge of honor to do some extra work and to make yourself better. And, you know, within, within reason. Yeah. Um, but once you cross that line and you question it, then mm. you know, something's wrong. When I was at Disney, I pushed so hard, but I never felt like, why am I doing this? I'm like, I know why I'm doing this. When you start to go like, why am I doing this? It doesn't mean you shouldn't be but it means that there's other factors there that have overtaken you that you're not even conscious of yet. And you should yeah. step back and, and take a look because you want to animate for a long time. There's no use cooking yourself on one picture. That's a, that's a really amazing point. What you just made this idea that some it, it, culturally, some studios, and I've seen this firsthand, they, they put too much of an emphasis, like culturally, it, like this idea of a badge of honor. I've seen animators literally throw themselves on their own sword and almost completely destroy themselves because they are going to be recognized as a hard worker and like production loves them because they're such a hard worker. It's like, you know what, if you're in an environment like that, it's toxic. I'm telling you right now, you need to find another job because it's not going to end well for you because there's no, because really at the end of the day, you should be, you should be valued because of your, what you bring to the team, as far as who you are as a human being and how you support the people around you. And, you know, obviously, and your craft, your craftsmanship, craftswomanship, yeah. craft, whatever ship, like just whatever you bring to the team, but also like you should also as, as, as a, as a professional, you need to learn the skills to how to take care of yourself because burning out can lead to pro bigger, longer term production loss. So what's the point of burning yourself out? If you're then out down for the count for the next month and a half, it makes no sense. Yeah, so exactly. Yeah. I, I hope that eventually we'll see, you know, when you see people that stay until, you know, 11 midnight, 1 a.m., that yeah. it, it, it's a sign of failure somewhere yeah. by the studio, by the yeah. team, by management, by production, exactly. by whoever. And sometimes it's not even by, by, by production, but it's OK. Now that's the price we pay for the failure and we need right. to find out yeah. where is this failure. We're not going yeah. to use the Band-Aid of badge of honor of working hard to kind of pretend yeah. that, well, that's how yeah. The, yeah. the industry is. No. No, this is not it how it doesn't have it, to be it, like that at all. Be. Yeah. Absolutely and just one, one quick clarification, too, for people that might be listening to this conversation, because I think this is really important. There is a big difference in my mind between people that are staying late because they're taking it to the next level because it's on yes. for them. It's and, and this is a difficult balance. So I, I, need, I need to be specific here. I myself don't feel like I'm burning out 
when I'm putting my own time in because I want to make it awesome versus I'm killing myself just to get it done. Animators can sustain really, really high thresholds of stress and like, and just work when they are doing it out of passion because it's coming from like an extra reserve. Even that it's, it's not, it's not completely sustainable. Like we have to be careful, but I mean, it's, if when it's, when you're pulling from a good place and you feel like you're looking around, there's other people there, they're just going for gold. This feels different. It feels rewarding. When you get to the finish line, you feel like there's something was worth it. But when you get to the finish line and you got nothing left and you don't even quite get there and you feel like a failure and you're done and you're cooked just to get, just to try to get something done. That's where that's, that's the problem. That's a, that's a failure in planning like you said plan, fa- failure in management from like just letting it happen you know you want a studio that's you know keep monitoring that and making sure that it's the right kind of an environment and if it's not you tell your people to go freaking home yeah, because sometimes it. they Absolutely. don't know to go home and in, in the worst cases they're going to take as a an example look those are staying light why are you not yeah. staying, right. like, staying the, light which is pushing even exactly. further this insanity that's yeah, it. that's it. Yeah, that's it's such a good topic because I mean, it's it's something that's going to be you're going to be dealing with it no matter where you are. Different studios deal with it in different ways. OK, another question. We've got a little bit more time left. Um, David, do you want do you find with me just pulling these questions? Do you want one? That, you've got a couple that you want to ask? I I, uh, I didn't look <laughs> at the, at the chat that at all. an answer of no, Brent, go ahead and ask another question. OK, exactly. so let's see. We got another one here. Um, um this is a, I, I like this one a lot. This is a really good one. It's a juicy one. So here's a question from the 3DG machine. I love that handle. How do you find people in, how do you TED, you know, and this, this would apply to anybody with lots of experience like you. Where do you get your feedback from? Oh my gosh. I, yeah. I, <laughs> That's a good one. I like it. I'm, yeah, like, wow, I I'm my own hardest critic. And uh, one, I don't know whether it would be deemed healthy or un- unhealthy. I think about things all the time. Like I try not to take myself too seriously, but I take my work very seriously. Mm -hmm. And I think that I understand that in my position, what I need to accomplish helps scores of people have a better experience. Okay. It's up to me to plan, to share the plan, to get assistance in the plan, to make everyone clear and, and lay it out so things can go as smoothly as possible and people can have the best experience possible. So since I lay out this plan in front of me and, you know, like the multiple plan A's and B's that, you know, B's and C's that might happen, my feedback comes from me in terms of how I, what, how well I felt I did in achieving mm. that one step. Okay. So if I break it down into 10 steps, I go, it's like 10 parts on a test. How well did I do on that section? And and since they're in bite-sized chunks, I don't lose perspective on like what it means globally about me. I don't worry about that. Mm -hmm. I just kind of go, okay, I planned this with a a lot of thought and how am I doing? Because there's a net result that's supposed to happen from kind of setting that up. And if it's not working, then I make adjustments. If it's not working at all, I remove it. I examine it to see what I could replace it with, and I remove it. And then that's kind of what where my feedback comes from, is really just looking at the plan, making sure it's solid, and where it's failing and not. Um, mm-hmm. That's kind of where I get it from. And when you said this feedback, usually where is it uh, coming from? From the animators themselves, from production, from management, from where would they be coming from most of the time? Well, I think the feedback really is watching things unroll and Mm. unfold. And if they unfold properly, it's like watching a story that makes Mm. sense. And when it doesn't, the story stops making sense Mm. or it, it runs into a dead end and I go, okay, I just ran into a dead end, okay. Mm. It's it's like it, would you is a sort of like the the feeling of being a coach on on here we go another hawk and edge just so I can fit in here, <laughs> but it, you, you know you've taught you've worked with your team for for months on these plays and then it's like and then that moment where you're like you're watching it just happen 
And you're like, they're doing it. They're doing yeah. it. They're doing it. And then it happens. The goal gets, the puck goes in the net and it just feels like, wow. So is that the feedback mechanism? Then as you sort of measure, it's a little bit more tricky because it's, it's, if it was so simple as a puck going in the net, it's a very Boolean outcome. Obviously there's a lot more nuance to making it work on a team. But I mean, I guess yeah. that's the feeling you probably get is you sit back and you just kind of get a gauge as to whether all those many little steps and those little things that you, there's investments yeah. you've made across the board when you start to feel it starting to move forward yeah. in the right direction. But it's I'm like highly you... fascinated by that. Yeah. Like that whole plan, the master yeah, yeah. plan thing oh, yeah. fascinates me. Yeah. And, yeah. But ultimately, I think I listen to my animators, um, you know, uh, a lot. And and I like you said, just watching things roll out. <laughs> the end. But I would say, especially when you do a presentation, you, you know, you, you sense the crowd. Whether we you have like ten yeah. people in front of you or three hundred people of you, you see in the eyes, you see in how how engaged they, they are. So you have a feeling if it, if it works or not. And then the individual feedback kind of explain w why it went it, it, right. it's so good or why it, it wasn't that interesting. Right. I really like that question because it's sort of like the whole who watches the watchman, you know, who mentors the mentors. Like what they, it's you do. There is a dilemma, right? As you as you escalate, it's, it's, if you think it's hard to find a mentor when you're an, an, a new animator, like a good one, <laughs> think of how someone like Ted feels where it's like, OK, so I'm teaching all these people things. But like, where do I learn new tricks to teach people even better things? Like it's like it's big different mechanisms and different skills have to sort of you have to find you have to get very, very creative and very clever with what you need to be able to do, because sometimes you will find yourself where there is literally no no expert in your local vicinity that you can just tap at work like I, you're the I one who's also, supposed to have all the answers right one thing i do also do is um mm. i look to um emerging lights and people in different subcultures mm. so you know um recently there's a, a skateboarder named andy anderson he's this young kid he skates for Powell and he's a kind of like a free spirit guy. Mm. And he, what I find so interesting about him, he's so himself, like he wears a helmet all the time, which is very against <laughs> like the culture of skaters. Yeah, you know, totally. It's not cool to wear not a helmet. Cool. Yeah, exactly. And yet he's more of what the spirit of a skater is supposed to mm. be, which is irreverent to, mm -hmm. to like expectation. Yeah. So he's actually more of a skater just being himself. But I think, you know, <laughs> watching different fields and watching people talk about what they care about and what mm -hmm. matters to them and yeah. what success means to them on, on different levels. Right. My goals are global for the studio, for the people to prove them right for, for believing in me, but also to like, I'm providing hopefully an elevator and a safety net for my people at the same time and to allow them like to go as many floors as they can safely and as yeah. quickly as possible, but also to know that if it fails, like they're good, you know? And I think that's where I get my feedback from is yeah. like the feeling of people. Right. They're the mm -hmm. success of your team is in, in fact, the, your success itself, right? That's it's the like, whole point. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Me, you know? It's funny. It's almost like as an animator, your Bible that you refer to at the beginning is like the animator survival guide or whatever. And then eventually when you get up to, when you start to you know, work on a different level of abstraction, it's now you're looking at books like creative ink, right? It's like, mm -hmm. now you're worried about how can I build a culture? How can I get a team to really work well together? Cause that's that's and it's, a, it's an exciting feeling. Like, I think we all lit up when we started talking about this because we all work in a similar capacity. We're really interested in the sort of the mechanisms and the, the, the fascinating sort of machinery that goes into building and, and, and to, um, to, to, uh, what's the, what's the word I'm looking for to, um, to nurture, to nurture a team, you know, was that <laughs> engineering <laughs> and yeah, it kind of feels like an, it is, it's like a social engineering thing, right? It's, I don't like it's, it, there is a bunch of, I don't know. It's just, that's hard to describe, but it's, it is fascinating yeah. and it's quite exciting when you start to do a couple things and you see it actually working and you, and more importantly, you see, you see people like nothing feels better. And I think it's why we all teach too. Nothing feels better to me than watching someone who had aspirations to do, to, to, to get better at something. And then you help unlock a bunch of those things and watch that, that glow start to come from them when they feel like they're, they're doing it, you know? And it's yeah. like watching someone like my daughter, the first time she rode her bicycle, it just feels so awesome to watch her glow because she sorted it out right with a little bit of help from dad and you know what the the best part about that is you kind of knew it was going to happen yeah and it's brand new for them and you you yeah, saw yeah. it coming a mile totally. away 
Totally, totally. And then for them, it's a new discovery. And I think that's one of the most rewarding things when I see an animator having a hard time or doubt. I'm like, no, you don't worry. Just yeah, you take got care of this, this, and this. Yeah. And then you see them like, oh, and you're like, yeah, exactly. You're, you're right? like, great. But you're yeah. like, kind of like, yeah, you know yeah. what? You're like, I told you so in a good yeah, way. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Man, that's cool. So we got, I got, we got, well, it's five o'clock actually. So I don't want to keep you because I know how busy you are. So maybe we should wrap it up. Um, if you didn't get your it's question and answer, oh. you. my, my day is uh, done. So if you want to go 10 minutes for another, yeah, okay, sure. Questions. I'll ask a couple. I mean, I, I, I always do this and I, I don't want to make pressure anybody to stick around a little longer, but I mean, this is a great conversation. So I feel Absolutely. like I'm not the right person to stop it because if, if I've left my own <laughs> devices, we'll just keep going. Okay. I'll get, right, I'll give us a, a, rather than time. I'm going to say two more questions. Does that sound fair? Yeah. Let's see where it goes. All right. Um, all right. So next question. Now I got to like money up here and actually come up with a good question. I was too busy getting into that last one. Um, what, um, okay. This, this one comes up all the time. It's a bit of, it's a, it's, it's a kind of a usual suspect, but I think it's a good one to ask people. And I'm always curious to see how different people answer this question, but what would be the best piece of advice you'd give the younger version of Ted Ty? I, I almost said Ted Ty, Ted T. Um, relax <laughs> okay knock it off and relax enjoy life smell the flowers yeah man. and and it's it's um funny it's enough that that's exactly what andrew gordon says <laughs> it's as true well. it's exactly After really the same 10 second pause yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was like a profound moment thing? And he yeah, said, pretty much. Yeah, said, yeah. I would tell him to just relax, go, yeah, go on dude, your weekend chill. at Lake Tahoe, yeah. just chill That's a little it. bit, take it yeah. easy. Yeah, it's I don't know it. if I, by relax, I mean chill. And the reason I'm looking around here is I actually wrote down my definition of relax. Oh, you did? Because, yeah, <laughs> just recently I wrote it down because it's not typically what I think people would would think relax is, and if I could find it, I'd tell That's you. Funny. The irony is you wrote it down so you can remind yourself all the time, but now you can't find it. So now you, do, now you don't know how to relax. See, so you're screwed. relaxing is um, taking control of yourself, accepting that you're not controlling anything else. That's what I mean by relax. Uh, like I, I'm not one to go to a beach. Anyone who knows me is like my version of relax is kind of, you know, animate two hours less. Well, back in the day, now it's just like my brain's constantly, I'm, I literally, and, and not in a creepy way, obviously, think about my animators like all the time and like little things that they said or the ways that I could help them. <laughs> and that to me is like, I can relax by going and finding a better way to help my team out. You know, that's, yeah. that's relaxing for me. That's good. Mm. I think it's important too because it kind of it brings in a question like there you have to remind yourself there's things that are outside your control, man. You can't all the time. You just can't you can't fix all the things. You can focus on the things that you can fix on, but a uh, fix, but like the, everything else, you like those are those are adding to your emotional like your capacity and your load for stress. And they will literally stop you from being able to handle things that you could actually fix, which is yeah, I guess and, and the I wisdom in that, that advice. The only other piece of advice I would have given myself. And I, but I, I don't know if I would have, as I stuck with it is you just have to stick to your guns. Like, I think that all you've got is kind of honestly, and it maybe sounds old fashioned, but all you have is your word. Mm. And unless I don't intend to keep it, I won't give it right. like, and also too, there's a certain ethical line where I won't, I won't cross. And I think that's people have to know you and respect you for what you stand by, whether they like you or not, mm. you know, like ultimately I, I, I care for all my animators, but am I there to be their friend? Yeah. No. Yeah. That's, you know, that's, that's really wise. I like the idea because like you said, you can't, not, you can't make everyone your friend, but if you can at least focus on having redeemable qualities and you, this, you have integrity at the end of the day, yeah. then people that might not like you can still work with you. And that's the most important thing, right? Because you, you're worth life. nothing at work if you can't feel like you can at least be respected. Respected and liked are completely different spectrums. One's emotional and one is about business. And I think that that's really, really sound advice. And the beautiful thing about respect is that it's actually very easily achieved. Mm. Everyone just has to do their work uh, yeah. with like the, the best intentions in mind yeah. and be honest with everyone. And it, it just happens, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, last question, as I promised. And this one is, uh, I always like to end it with a fun one. And it's kind of cool because I think it will allow us to segue into something um, a little bit more tangential to the things we've been talking about. But the question is, what other forms of art do you like or do, are you involved in? Like what's going on in the personal life of Ted T? What, 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 what do you do when you're not building beautiful teams and making amazing feature films? What's going on? Um, I, you know, I used to play a lot more music uh, than I used to, um, a lot more. And I think so much of my energy has gone into my new job, you know, because it's brand new and I, you don't get a chance like this often. Like I don't, taking it easy for me is not an option at the start of this, you know, uh, and that's exciting. I think artistically, I still work on my own, on my own projects that I pitch. Okay. So that's uh, really important to me. Um, and, but that's really it hmm. artistically, you know, I think, I think that's kind of it. I even, ironically, I moved to Montreal and I don't play hockey and I lived in LA and I played like three times a week. So that's a, <laughs> oh my god we're having a nice it, moment of like uh, nostalgia here from your anime classes oh Apparently my you god. started one, one class playing guitar you That's see, awesome. i used to it's proof that i used to but there i don't know much anymore yeah he's not making this up he actually apparently can really play uh, i thought I you were going to talk about your martial art background which didn't come up in this conversation which i thought it might have but because you're no. big in it you, you, you actually that's not true you made a clever reference to martial arts with your with your your, your oh your, yeah your, your belt colors which i thought was a clever integration of the martial arts sub, uh, subject but you would you like I, that's something i didn't know about you so i'm actually curious like what are is this something are you is it what what type of martial art are you currently involved with i'm not I mean, right now oh, okay I'm but too, used to I'm too brittle too busy um, too brittle. but, uh, okay. but i did um Kyokushin Kai Karate for okay. 15 years. And then I did Taekwondo for another 15 years. Wow. That's some dedication. Yeah. But it's mostly because uh, I was not good at team sports. Mm. And that's why even in hockey, I'm a goalie because it's the most <laughs> individual of like. Yeah, that's um, funny. Yeah, because I just master wanted, of your own domain, right? Like, no matter if the team fails you, you still have yourself. You can still get that friggin' puck away from the from the net. But I can't lie. I love the pressure. Well, like this, I love it. Like you know, you could ask David. I love pressure. Everybody I know, every single one of my friends who plays goalie, they all are interesting characters. Every single one of them. It takes a special type of personality to literally a very selfless, very dedicated personality to decide to put yourself between a net and a very, very fast moving projectile. There's a, there's either something wrong with you, no offense, Ted, or, and, or there's something very, very special. And I mean, I honestly think that most of my friends would, they would, they would agree to both of those things that they're or very, very different or very lazy because for me, I don't need lazy. to chase the puck. Less to hating, to yeah. So <laughs> it's like, you know, just keep it from going in the net and it's like the easiest job there. Ted, I've never worked with you, but something tells me that laziness is not really part of your vocabulary. <laughs> nice try. Nice try. Nice try. On, you know, I'll give you full points for trying your hand at humility. Um, okay. Well, you know, Ted, that was, it was, it was honestly awesome. I really enjoyed this. Thanks um, so much. We've met casually a couple of times. We had a couple of conversations, but I never really felt like I got to know you like I did right now. And it was really fun. So thank you for really, being on the really show. Fun. Can I shout awesome. out to my team? Do it. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure there's probably lots of them in the in the, in the chat. Go ahead. Do you make feature animation? <laughs> Represent. <laughs> <laughs> you better be here. Otherwise, you're fired. Just kidding. Um, well, Ted, we, we told you about the memes that we create with those. That's. That, that's, that's one of them right there. Oh, what no. you just did there. Yeah. yeah. Well, you just did we it. warned you. We warned you, <laughs> man. You were warned. Well, <laughs> so thank you. Thank you to, to any DNEG people in the audience. That's, thanks for showing up. And uh, thanks for all of the Agora community and anybody outside of the Agora community who showed up for this conversation. Thank you, Ted T. Thank you, David Hubert. Thanks so much. That was really fun. That, that Hopefully was we get you back one day, but don't say yes right away because we, we we put our hooks in you and then we don't let you go. So just <laughs> say it off air. Tell me whether you want to come back or not without one, being under the pressure. Day. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <clears throat> Maybe. All right. Thank you, guys. Talk to you soon. All right. Cheers. Take care. Bye, guys. So yet another amazing conversation. Um, as per usual, David and I are spoiled. I keep getting all these messages like of like, dude, really? Like, really? How did you find the opportunity to sit there every week and like get like just get to like 
chill out with all these amazing people and just catch up and and I, I mean I'm privileged. I want to say like I'm really really lucky to be able to be in a position like that and um and hopefully you all can at least live vicariously through these conversations and feel like you're part of them. I know it would be nice if you were all in the room. I would love nothing more than these conversations to be live and you know maybe one day when the dust settles on this bane that is on humanity right now maybe we can do something like this I, I i dream about the day that we can bring like literally the conversation with do like the roadshow version where we like go and like actually god forbid be in like in the same room with some of these people this would be really cool but uh, in the meantime this is how we're going to do it so we're going to bring our little bubble into your world and your lives so hopefully you're appreciating this little um this little distraction every week that we're trying to provide because i know that i am and i know that david is as well so uh, thank you for being here. Um, we have a next one. Um, I, I, I always forget to have this up on the side. I'm sorry. I'm terrible. Let me just take a look. I want to just let you know what the next one is coming up. It is. Oh, I did have it up. What do you know? So the next one is going to be. Oh, one sec. I'm listening to my, my, myself just like five minutes or five seconds ago in my ear now. So um, Harvey Newman is going to be here um, next week on Thursday. 3.30 p.m. Eastern Standard. Harvey Newman is um, an animator and he, I believe he's in the UK. I know he's on sort of kind of the opposite side of the planet, but he um, he also has a YouTube channel. So he's got lots to talk about there. He's one of the sort of the very rare people that uh, not only love animation so much and somehow find the spare time, like the Sir Wades and the JDs of this planet, they find the time to, to, to also put themselves out there and you know, make content for everybody to learn from. So we'll have lots to talk about on that conversation as well he was actually you might have seen him he was actually one of the hosts um slash guests at our um our um 24 hour ultimate animation challenge so for without further ado let's wrap this one up see you on the next one and um stay animated everybody cheers Thank you.